good to be with you again. Our topic in this session is time to lead. Folks, in my opinion, we have a leadership deficit in our nation. And I'm not talking about Washington, D.C. I think we have to start in our own hearts and our own churches. And I'm not even pointing at the pulpit. You know, in most cases, the, the unofficial leadership in the church is far more significant than the official leadership. And we need the opportunity to lead in, for the cause of Christ. Leadership is about influence. It's not about titles, positions, nameplates, benefit packages. It's about influence. Are you using your influence for the sake of the kingdom of God? And here's a clue. I'm not talking about using it someplace else, not using it at the church or in a committee meeting or a board meeting or in the office place. It starts around your kitchen table. It starts around your holiday table. Are you taking the influence for the kingdom of God? Do you have the courage to take those values and talk about them within your family system? It's an important time. It's an important lesson. Grab your Bible, get a notepad, but most of all, open your heart. The title for this session is Time to Lead, and it is time to lead. Leadership isn't about titles or positions or authority or the corner office. It's not about how large the plaque is or how many followers you have. Leadership is ultimately all about influence. And all of us have influence. All of us have people who care about your opinion, what you think, how you feel, what you see happening. It may not be as large a group or it may not even be the group you would prefer to care about your opinions. But someone cares. And if every one of us will make a commitment to use our influence for the sake of the kingdom of God, our world will change. So I want to spend a few minutes and unpack this notion just a little bit. Leadership is essential. There was a time in my life I thought leadership was a secular word, and it really shouldn't be intermixed with Christianity, that we just be led by the Spirit. Well, the Spirit will lead you to be a leader. Amen is the word you're searching for. If you're just here to watch, you're in the wrong spot. This is going to be an interactive lesson. We're going to pray multiple times. I'm going to ask you to pray with me and pray for some other people. I didn't invite you to church tonight just to, to stare at somebody or to watch somebody sing. We're going to invite God into the midst of our lives tonight. But leadership is a necessity. If we are to see the purposes of God break forth in this generation, we've got to stop waiting for somebody else. We've got to stop waiting for another church or a more anointed pastor or a more anointed speaker or a different political party or a different something or other. We've got to be willing to say, if there's a difference to be made, I'm willing to be a part of that. If we'll make that decision, I believe God will move. Ezekiel chapter 22. God is speaking through the prophet. I looked for a man among them who would build up the wall and stand before me in the gap on behalf of the land so I wouldn't have to destroy it. But I found none. So I'll pour out my wrath on them and consume them with my fiery anger, bringing down on their own heads all they have done, declares the sovereign Lord. It's a pretty sobering passage to me. God said, I looked for somebody. I searched the people to see somebody who was willing to take a stand, to use their influence on behalf of my purposes, and I couldn't find anybody. I'd like to rewrite that. I'd like it to be said that the enemy looked for somebody who would take a stand on his behalf to give demonstration to evil and wickedness and ungodliness, but he couldn't find anybody because everybody's hearts were so fully devoted to the Lord. Y'all are pretty quiet. I think that's a pretty good scenario to begin to imagine. I think it's time to stop moaning about the rise of wickedness and evil and ungodliness and start to light the fuse on goodness and godliness and righteousness and purity and holiness. There are values that we want to see upheld and values that we want to see grow and values that we want to see flourish, which means we'll have to turn away from them and then we'll have to be so excited about our turning that we tell somebody else that we'll see God looking at us going, I'll stand there. I don't know, I can't, maybe I can't occupy a very big gap, but I'll stand in this place, Lord. If that's where you want me to stand, I'll stand here. God is searching for men and women. I think Proverbs 29 and verse 18 is a pretty accurate description of our current landscape where there is no revelation. Some translations say where there is no vision. They, they both work where there's not an awareness of the things of God. The people cast off restraint. But blessed is he who keeps the law. Here's the alternatives. The one yielded to God who chooses to live in holiness and righteousness and purity 
or the one who can't see any God perspective. It's not apparent to them, so they cast off restraint. Traditions won't hold them. Laws won't hold them. Rebellion takes hold of them. You see, we need a demonstration of godliness as an invitation to others. The front door of invitation towards the kingdom of God throughout scriptures, both Old and New Testaments, isn't a theoretical presentation. It's a demonstration of the power of God. And when that power is made evident, people move towards the Lord. Where there is no vision, we cast off restraint. Is it accurate to say that in our nation, to to a great degree, we have cast off restraint? Seems like that to me. We don't want to be inhibited any longer. I read a, an article in the last, I guess it was today, yesterday or today, where the people said if the Supreme Court rules against our will, we will not be governable. That's a public declaration of rebellion. We'll only obey the laws that we like. I don't know why we're surprised. We've been descending into lawlessness for quite a while. Now, Jesus told us it would happen. He told us it would happen. He said as we approach the end of the age that the the increase of wickedness would become so intense, so prevalent, that the love of most would grow cold. That lawlessness would escalate. Lawlessness is kind of a fancy word for rebellion, but we see it in our nation. It's growing day over day. Rebellion against authority. A refusal to yield to almost any authority. We don't even want to yield to parental authority over children. Understand, if they can separate you from the most fundamental expressions of authority in your life, then we will have cast off all restraint. Don't forfeit your well-being to the government. The government is not God. I'm grateful for good government, but you should never confuse the two. There is a God, and we serve under His authority. And even a more, I think a more frightening perspective from history is that a government apart from the influence of godly people always moves towards greater expressions of authoritarian control. The only barrier against that is the force of the Spirit of God that's expressed through godly people. Because human beings apart from the Spirit of God do not treat one another equitably. We don't live in peace Human history is a broad canvas displaying that very fundamental reality. And if somebody is telling you that your community, your school, our nation, any place will be better separated from a God perspective, they are deceptive. We've seen this lawlessness growing. Sanctuary cities, not a new thing. It's been going on for quite a while now, way over a decade Cities in our nation ignoring federal law, refusing to enforce federal law, yet they demanded federal funding. We've been watching for several years now. It's reaching something of a crescendo, but illegal immigration pouring across our southern border now, tens of thousands of people on a weekly basis. The operative word in that is illegal. I'm an advocate for immigration. We're a nation of immigrants. We don't come from a single place. We don't look the same nor sound the same. We are a melting pot. What's bound us together was a set of values, but we have a process for legal immigration. Illegal immigration is just as troubling as an illegal withdrawal from your bank. If they want to change our immigration policies, we have a process for doing that. But if those that are in charge of our government can ignore the laws, they can ignore the same laws that protect you and me. We've watched a growing call to defund the police. Lawlessness, even when we see the outcomes, the rapid increase in violence in our cities, those that were calling for the diminished in presence of the police are not willing to link the two. We've watched an increasing politicization of our military. Folks, the military is not a social experiment. They have a primary job is to defend our nation. And if we plunge them into political correctness, they'll fail in their primary mission. 
And now we see it reaching something of a zenith with the decision of a Supreme Court being leaked in advance of the release of the decision so that public opinion can be expressed to try to change the minds of the justices. It's a very flimsily clad attempt to bully and intimidate our judicial system at the highest levels. And now we're seeing in major cities across our nation gangs and mobs of people wreaking havoc day over day. Are you watching? Lawlessness is growing. Proverbs 29 again said, where there's no revelation, where there's no vision, the people cast off restraint. When you believe the consequence is real, You'll cooperate with guidance. You see, when what's being delivered to you, when you believe it's truthful, you're far more likely to cooperate. The best example of that we've had in recent memory was COVID-19. We believed the threat. So we sheltered in place. There was a few weeks around Middle Tennessee where there was no traffic. It was a wonderful time to go for a drive. It may not have been very healthy, but it was certainly liberating. We believe the information we were given and we cooperated. Well, I would submit to you that we as the church have lost sight of the consequences of godliness and ungodliness. Somehow they've been conflagrated. They've they've been mixed up. We've imagined that the outcomes are really not that different. That it won't make that great of a difference if you're godly or ungodly. I can be ungodly and just say, I'm sorry. Look, you can't mock God. You can't be a Christ follower, present yourself as a believer in Jesus and as a part of a community of faith and practice ungodliness without a consequence. On the other hand, we have good news for people that aren't Christ followers and they're trapped in the domination of ungodliness and the dissatisfaction it brings. The the power of sin over their lives can be broken. But the church has to have the clarity to understand there is a very real consequence between godliness and ungodliness. I would submit to you, we need greater clarity in our heavenly vision. Remember the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray? Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. People say to me a lot, you know, Pastor, if if I knew what God's vision for me was, I'd be all in. Let me help you. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's our assignment. Whatever little poor corner of the place he's planted us, to the best of our ability, let your will be done. Let it be let your will be done in my home. Let your will be done in my neighborhood. Let your will be done in the place where I work. Now we'll need God's help to do that because we're limited and frail and broken and inconsistent. But you see, a heavenly vision is a life assignment for every Christ follower. Any further insight beyond that is really dependent upon your obedience and mine. Why should God give us any further insight until we're willing to be obedient with the truth that we know? God's not going to present you with a menu. Well, I'll take a little bit of one and four and eight. Two, three, and seven are a bit intrusive, and I'm not sure I believe them. God won't do that. When we begin to respond enthusiastically the truth he's given us, he will give us greater insight. We need a vision beyond ourselves. Look at Acts 26. Many Paul is reciting the story of his conversion. Many of you know it. He said, I ask, who are you, Lord? I'm Jesus, whom you're persecuting. And the Lord replied, get up and stand on your feet. I've appeared to you to appoint you as a servant and as a witness of what you've seen of me and what I will show you. I'll rescue from your, you from your own people and from the non-Jews. I'm sending you to them to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God so that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who were sanctified by faith in me. So then, King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the vision from heaven. Paul is telling his life story in terms of an awareness, a revelation, an insight, an understanding. I want to suggest to you that you and I want to tell our life story in terms of an understanding, an insight, a revelation, a vision, more than we tell it in terms of a degree earned, a profession chosen, a level of affluence secured, 
that we want our journey through time to be defined by a vision of the purposes of God. Now, it can be told in the context of a profession or a family or the pursuit of other things. But the dominant characteristic, the primary attribute, is the fact that we wanted to see your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Amen. Now, as Paul just told us, that begins with a Jesus encounter. We all need this. We all need a Jesus encounter. If your vision tonight is small, if the, the magnitude of your revelation does not seem to be large enough for the current season, I'm not questioning your salvation. I'm not questioning the authenticity of your, your conversion or the reality of the fact that you've been born again. I'm suggesting we need a grander vision of Jesus. Think of the disciples. <clears throat> when Jesus first encountered them, he said, follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. And for the next three years, they were amazed day after day. He speaks to storms. We didn't know he could speak to storms. He casts out demons. We didn't know he could cast out demons. He cast a legion of demons out of a man into a herd of pigs and the pigs drowned. We've never seen that before. He sent me to go catch a fish and I paid my taxes with the, the money in the mouth of a fish. First time I'd ever fished for taxes. I mean, every day was a new experience. You and I, is it fair to say that you and I need a greater revelation of Jesus? You see, we've got, we have to have a greater hunger than for that than we do for whatever else our, our request of the day is. Jesus, I need to see you with greater clarity. I need to know you in a more personal way. I want to understand your character, your nature, your power, your desire for me. Jesus, I want to see you. Don't spend your time being angry at what's happening. Spend your time talking to the Lord. And when you have those encounters with Jesus, don't turn loose of them. And for heaven's sakes, don't build an altar and camp there. We have a, a, a remarkable tendency when we experience the Lord to imagine that we have, we've had the ultimate God experience. And we've had perhaps the only way to experience God. I knew a lady one time that had a God experience. While she was getting ready for work in the morning, she, her, her home was cold. and She would open the oven door and turn the oven on and get ready for work in front of the oven. And God met her there one day. So guess what she did when a neighbor came and said they needed to know the Lord? She went and turned the oven on, opened the door, stood the lady in front of the oven and said, this is where God meets people. We all have our own version of that. It's based on the church we believe or the denomination we choose or the translation, something, and we try to make it unique. God's bigger than my experiences. Don't turn loose of your Jesus experience. You see, a heavenly vision is beyond ourselves. It's beyond my plans, beyond my dreams, beyond my wants. It's a willingness to accept God's perspective and God's purpose. Are you willing to do that? Or would you really just prefer God would answer your requests? Are we really willing to say to the Lord, my time is your time. My future is your future. Let your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Usually when we pray that, we mean somebody else needs to be different. Right? You pray for Washington. God, let those people be different. <laughs> or you pray for someone somewhere. Look in Jeremiah chapter 1. Oh, mercy. Jeremiah is being recruited. God has a vision for Jeremiah that Jeremiah doesn't have for himself. Did you know God has a bigger vision for you than you have for yourself? There have been multiple times in my life people have looked at me and said, Alan, God has something for you that you're not aware of. And I'm going, no, no, I'm really aware. I'm born again. I'm spirit-filled. I read my Bible. I pray. I tithe. I'm not engaged in too many excessive expressions of ungodliness. I'm fully aware. And it didn't, the people would, you know, they would say it to me and kind of move on. And then I'd keep living through it. And I'd look back some years later and say, you know, they were right. God has more for you tonight than you know. We're going to pray in just a moment. I hope you're getting ready. Jeremiah 1, the word of the Lord came to me saying, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. 
Jeremiah, before you had any dream at all, I knew you. I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. And I said, ah, sovereign Lord, I don't know how to speak. I'm only a child. And the Lord said, don't say that. Don't say that. What do you say that is your attempt to neutralize the Lord? The place where I work is too dark. My neighborhood is just not a godly place. My prayers haven't made a difference in the past. Why would I pray now? Whoever's on your prayer list will never change. What do you say? What are you currently allowing to be said? Whether you say it out loud or you just say it in your mind, are you saying that neutralizes what God would say about you? God said, don't say I'm only a child. You must go to everyone I send you to and say whatever I command you. I'm telling you, that's an awkward assignment. You have to go wherever I tell you to go, and when you get there, you have to say whatever I tell you to say. Whew. Don't be afraid of them. You know why God had to tell him that? Because he's going to give you some frightening things to say. For I am with you, and I will rescue you, declares the Lord. And the Lord reached out his hand, and he touched my mouth, and he said to me, Now I have put my words in your mouth. See, I appoint you today over nations and kingdoms to uproot and tear down, to destroy and overthrow, to build and to plant. We read Jeremiah from a historic perspective. We know the outcome at the beginning, but Jeremiah doesn't. When he hears that, God's just saying, you need to go where I ask you to go and do what I say to do. Sounds a whole lot like, Father, let your kingdom come and your will be done, right? And God's already sent us. We know that. It's not a dramatic assignment. He's simply to ask to stand up for God's truth. But it's an unpopular assignment. Are you willing to stand up for God's truth? Are you a covert operative for the kingdom? You know, Pastor God needs a few undercover agents, and I, I volunteered. I try to look like a world and act like a pagan. But when there's an opportunity, I'll break out my Jesus story. Folks, that's deception. We're going to have to be willing to stand up for the truth. God's truth will create dramatic outcomes. I tell you that because I want to relieve you of the burden. You don't have to be dramatic. You and I don't have to do great things. God's truth does great things. All that he's really asking us to do is be faithful. We can say a one-sentence prayer without drawing any attention to ourselves and move on, and God will do the most remarkable things. You can simply just say to somebody that you work with or that lives next door to you, I believe Jesus is real, and plant that seed and watch the great things God will do with that. We've got to be willing to begin to use our voice, our strength, our influence for the kingdom of God. I want to pray with you, if I may. It's not the end of the service. You can't leave. Pat, you can't come back just yet. But I want to pray for you that God will give you a greater vision. Are you willing to receive it? How many of you would be willing to receive a greater vision? Okay, now you, you understand the, the, the preface for that is obedience for the truth that you know tonight. We're going to come to that prayer in just a moment. But right now, I'm going to ask the Lord to give us an understanding heart in a new way. How about just turning your hands up to the Lord to receive? And if I can make a suggestion, if you get up in the morning and you don't feel different, God, you didn't miss God. If you get all through the week and you go, well, you know, nothing different happened. You keep saying to the Lord, Lord, I want everything you have for me. I want everything you have for me. I want everything you have for me. I have a friend that from time to time we walk and pray together. And for more than a decade, we've walked and prayed and said, God, we want everything you have for our lives. And we haven't always seen dramatic responses or interventions. But as I look back over those years of walking and praying on multiple occasions, God has brought pretty remarkable dramatic changes into our journeys. You ready? Hallelujah. Father, thank you for your word. And I thank you for your people. I thank you that you're still searching the earth for men and women who have a heart towards you. And Lord, we turn our hearts to you and our hands to you tonight to receive all that you have for us. Give us understanding hearts. Give us a vision beyond ourselves. Father, thank you. I thank you. 
I thank you that you've called us to this very unique season. And I thank you that in new ways, we will see your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We receive tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. Now turn to the person on your right and say, I receive it. Better check out the one on your left. How about you? I want to give you one more component. I've got about five minutes. We've had a heavenly vision. I think it's important to have a heavenly diagnosis. I grew up in a medical household. My dad was a veterinarian. I used to play this little game when I was a kid. He would invite us to go along with him on calls <clears throat> or when he was going to see an animal. And there was always that point where he'd meet the owner and they'd begin to describe whatever they'd observed. And then he'd want to go see the animal and do his own evaluation and all of that. I was just an observer. So I started playing this little game while I'm listening to the person tell the doctor and then he goes and looks at the animal and I'm watching what he does in my head. I'm trying to get to the conclusion before he tells me what he thinks it is. So I learned this little habit of, of trying to move through a flow of information towards a, a diagnostic conclusion. It was just a game. I'm not a doctor. I didn't even stay at a Holiday Inn Express last night. You don't want medical advice from me. But a heavenly diagnosis is when God looks at us and tells us the truth about our condition. It's not always fun, but it's the necessary step in being healthy. In Revelation chapter 2, it's a message to a church in Thyatira. And to the angel of the church in Thyatira write, These are the words of the Son of God, whose eyes are like blazing fire and whose feet are like burnished bronze. I know your deeds your love and your faith, your service and perseverance, and that you're now doing more than you did at first. That's a pretty good response. I know your deeds. I know your love and your faith. I know your service and your perseverance, and you're doing more now than you did at the beginning. That's a pretty good evaluation, isn't it? Right? I mean, if the Lord said that to you, how many of you go, oh, yeah, yeah. I sure am. But he's not done. He said, nevertheless, I have this against you. And I want you to hold that for just a minute. The Lord can say things to us that are very affirming and encouraging and strengthening, but he loves us enough to say, but there's an adjustment to be made. See, we've, we've morphed God into this kind of a mashup of the fairy godmother and Santa Claus and the Easter bunny. and He's just loving. He just wants to hug us. He just wants to give you an attaboy. And it's true that God loves you. But it also means he loves you too much to leave you at a place beneath your potential. And just like he knew Jeremiah when he was knit together in his mother's womb, he knows you. And don't reject the correction or the rebuke from the Lord. I'm not talking about from me, but have your heart open when the Lord begins to talk to you and says, you know, what about that? What about that attitude? Or what about that response? Or what about that habit? It may not be a sin of biblical proportion and that it's listed someplace, but your time and energy and effort and the, the ambition of your life is being taken away from me. God says to this church, I have this one thing against you. You tolerate that woman Jezebel. She calls herself a prophetess, and by her teaching, she misleads my servants into sexual immorality and the eating of food sacrificed to idols. We meet Jezebel as a Phoenician queen in the Old Testament. She's not Jewish, but she's an immoral, lustful person of tremendous influence that does her best to disrupt and destroy the purposes of God. And what God says to this church in the midst of these wonderful statements of affirmation of love and faith and good deeds and that they're, they're more on fire than they were at the beginning, he said, you have tolerated in your midst the propagation of immorality and wickedness and the diminishment of the things of God. And he said, I won't accept that. You've got to deal with it. 
And from my vantage point, my opinion, the church in our nation has tolerated sexual immorality. We have tolerated wickedness. And in many respects, we have been tolerant while others were intolerant of God's people. We didn't stand up for them. If someone was suffering a consequence because they prayed in a public place, we would shake our heads and say they should have known better. I'm sorry for when I've been quiet. I should have known better than to be quiet. I should have stood with my brothers and sisters. We need God's prayers in our schools. We need God's prayers in our courtrooms. We need God's prayers in our surgery centers. We need God's prayers. I think there's two points of repentance that are appropriate for us from that diagnosis. We have been a bit satisfied with our successes. A bit satisfied with our successes, just like that church in Thyatira. They could point at all the things they'd done right, the things they had done well, their years of faithfulness. And we can do that in many ways. We can tell our God stories. We can give our testimonies. We can point at our achievements. We become a bit smug with our success, never imagining that the fundamentals of our lives would change. And they have. And we need a new response. And pointing to our trophy case or pointing to our plaques on the wall or reciting our conversion story is not the fullest expression of let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Secondly, I would submit we should repent of tolerating evil. And I don't want you to look through the windows and find some expression of evil. I think for too long we've tolerated evil in our own hearts in our own homes, in our own families. And because of that, we've seen it grow in ever-widening circles. The hardest place to tell the truth is at home. I can, I can illustrate that in a macro perspective. It's much easier to be an advocate for Jesus in another nation. If you're on a short-term mission trip, you can be Billy bad for Jesus. You're there for five days. You probably don't speak the language very well. You may never see the people again. They don't know your backstory. They don't know your character. So you can plant your flag and be a, a bold advocate for Jesus. It's much, 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 much more difficult to do that in the place where you live. If you're in the same community, in the same office, in the same neighborhood, and it's much more difficult than that to do it in your home. The people that live with you know the truth. And when you say to them, I would like to have a greater heavenly vision, it's hard to look them in the eye because they may snicker. In fact, it may be better to live it for a little while and let them ask you what's happened to you. But I want to ask you if you'd be willing to say a quick prayer with me of repentance, that we've been a little smug with our previous successes and blessings. And we have had a reluctance in our heart to, to acknowledge evil. We didn't want to be offensive. We didn't want to be rejected. We have tolerated what we know God won't tolerate. We don't have to be angry. But we have to be willing to tell the truth. Does that feel right to you? Folks, we need a God change. And He will change if we will change. So I want to offer one more prayer of repentance, and then I'm going to pray for you. How many of you would say, Pastor, I think that's right. I need some of that in my heart. Okay, I'm not going to ask you to stand just yet because I'm going to get you up in a minute. But this is a prayer you can take away. You can just quietly say to the Lord, Lord, I'm sorry. You know, maybe you want to spend a whole day with one of those points. Lord, I'm sorry. I have been far too aware of the good things you've done and the, the victories I've had and the, the good choices I have made. And I've pointed to that path with an arrogance and a pride. And Lord, I'm sorry because I'm in a place today where where I've been is not nearly as important as where I know I need to go. Give me a new vision. Lord, I'm sorry for my pride. It's so easy to do. Religious people get proud in a hurry, me included. It was Jesus' most persistent adversarial response. The people would come to him and he said, we're children of Abraham. What do we need from you? You can spend a day with that and then you can pick up the other one. Lord, forgive me for when I've been tolerating wickedness. I've tolerated it close to me. I've tolerated it in myself. I've tolerated it in the people I love. 
I didn't want to tell him the truth because I was afraid it might disrupt a dinner conversation or it might affect a, a holiday meal. Folks, we can't ask people to lead us on a broader scale towards God's truth if we're unwilling to own that truth in the places closest to us. It's not fair, it's not appropriate for those of us that are the church to ask God to raise up leaders that will speak the truth in broad platforms if we're not willing to speak the truth in those places where he's planted us. We're going to repent those two things. We just bow with me. Father, thank you. Thank you for your, for your spirit that brings conviction and truth and awareness and understanding. And Lord, we pause tonight to say we're sorry for our pride and our arrogance, for pointing out our successes to you. Lord, you are the one that's given them to us. You are the one that's brought blessings and prosperity and opportunities and abundance. You are the one that called us out of darkness into your kingdom. Lord, you are the one that has forgiven us and washed us and cleansed us and redeemed us. We couldn't save ourselves. We thank you for it. And forgive us tonight, Lord, for our arrogance, for the pride with which we've walked before you. Give us a spirit of humility, a new reverence for you. And Lord, we also ask you to forgive us for tolerating wickedness, for tolerating it in ourselves. Lord, we've all done that. Lord, forgive us. We turn our faces to you. And forgive us of tolerating it, Lord, wherever you've planted us, in our homes or our neighborhoods, wherever it may be. Lord, give us the courage to share your truth with your love. Not in an angry way. Not in a condemning or a belligerent way. But help us to be willing to speak the truth. I thank you for what you will do. In Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah. My time's up. I want to pray one more prayer. I brought you a prayer, but I'm not going to pray that with you. You can read that. You can take that home for extra credit. I'd like to offer one more prayer. If you're here tonight and you need a God event, maybe you need healing in your body or your, your resources are in a place where only God can work that out. Maybe you need a new job opportunity. Maybe you've got a relationship that's just about to break completely apart. Whatever that might be. If you're, and I, I don't mean you didn't get the parking place you wanted and you're still mad about it. That doesn't count. But if you're here and you need a God event, we want to pray for you. If that's you, will you just stand real quickly? If you're at home, you can stand with us there. If you're in one of the other sanctuaries, you stand. All right. Now, if you're not standing and you're near one of these people, or if you're standing, if there's two or three of you standing together, we're going to pray for one another. I'm going to pray, but I'm going to ask you to pray for one another. I'm just going to ask you to put a hand on a shoulder. But before you touch anybody, tell them your name. If somebody puts their hand on you and they haven't told you their name, you brush it off. Don't do it violently. But I mean that. I don't want strangers touching me. I don't want strangers praying for me. And you shouldn't either. I want people that are yielded to the Lordship of Jesus and filled with the Spirit of God to pray for me. But if you're near one of these people, you introduce yourself to them. And if they give you permission, you put your hand on their shoulder. We're going to pray for one another. The corporate prayers of God's people are powerful. All right, I'm going to give you 15 seconds. You, you may need to, you have to use your voice to do this, okay? You can move a little bit. It's okay. The Lord will still find you. All right, let's pray. Father, thank you for your word, for its truth and authority and power. I thank you that on the cross, a divinely ordered exchange took place where the sinless, perfect, obedient Son of God took all the punishment that was due by divine justice, our ungodliness and rebellion and wickedness, that in turn we might receive all of the blessings that were due, his perfect obedience. And Lord, we pray for one another tonight not in our strength or our power, but in the authority of Jesus' name, that you would bring life to our bodies, health to us, peace to our minds, that your abundance would fill our lives. We thank you for it, that the power of sin is broken over us in Jesus' name, that we've been set free for the purposes of God. Lord, as we pray for one another tonight, unleash your power, 
to bring wholeness to us, deliverance to us, new freedom to our lives, a new vision for our lives. I thank you for it in Jesus' name. Lord, we don't ask in our strength or our power, but in the authority of the name of our Lord, Jesus of Nazareth, we believe and we receive together. Amen. Hallelujah. Join us every week for another exciting message from Pastor Alan Jackson. And until then, visit us online and discover remarkable information and resources to help take your Christian life to the next level. And if you're visiting the Nashville area, we'd love to see you at World Outreach Church in Murfreesboro. We're easy to find, so look us up when you're traveling through. And don't forget to connect with Pastor Jackson every day through social media. Thanks so much for joining us and being a part of this ministry. We'll see you again next time for another encounter with Pastor Alan Jackson. Alan Jackson